I'm married to Alison. Alison and I commissioned Sylvia Dimitrova to do these seven paintings of women in the Bible over 17 years. We've got three daughters, so it's in, in our own home we've been talking about women in the Bible and the good news that is there. Ruth, the Moabite, widowed, bereaved, loyal and faithful to mother-in-law from Israel. Where you go, I will go. Where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people, and your God, my God. The world needs hope, and the greatest hope that I know is, is the good news of Christ. And so in writing poetry based on biblical text, I try to expound that hope. There's a lot of despair in, in the world, and there, there always has been. And so in, in writing poetry, I'm trying to reach people who need hope. The source material for the anthems is the biblical text and from that uh, comes the paintings and from that comes the poems and then the anthems. When you are the third artist of the party, as it were, um, you have to kind of take in on board everything that's been done already and find a way to integrate it into what you're doing. I think that the, the first painting I saw was Mary Magdalene. And it, what struck me about it immediately was the shape of the triangle and the fact that uh, Jesus in that painting has all of the colours from the rest of the painting in his own depiction. And then I moved on to the poem. What makes Graham's poetry very interesting in general is that yeah, the structures the unit, um, and so the forms that he here, uses actually, no are knows. not completely irregular. They move through series of regularities. They kind of evolve as, as the poem goes on. So, so th this, is, this is the poem of um, yes. Mary Magdalene, and uh, it's extraordinary that you, you've, under, you've underlined various things. Uh, yeah, but with the, it, the, the thing is the structure of the scansion, this kind of thing here, which, which struck out to me quite, quite quickly, yeah. as well as sort of this kind of quorum response, which didn't end up being used. It's on, um, from mature oaks, an acorn grows and then grows. So that's from, <laughs> from Sarah, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, and then in Priscilla, um, Priscilla and Aquila returned to Rome, hosting, oh, yeah. the, hosting body the body of Christ in yeah. their home. And you hit the home key on, yeah, on, the, on, the, on the, e. the right home. Yeah, hosting the body of Christ. <laughs> <laughs> I'd never read a poem quite like it before. You know, here it is stating questions and then it's, it's, it's kind of uh, got a similar scansion one after off the other and you're sort of looking at it and you're going, um, how do I set this musically? It's, it's actually a bit of a challenge. Who is this woman facing this man? Head lightly inclined, eyes wide open, gazing. Hands uplifted, palms upward, surprised, gorgeously arrayed. What I did eventually was split the poems apart into a, uh, what an anthem section and then a series of kind of ornamented 
Baroque style recitatives to ask the questions. So there would be question and then there would be answer. And then to incorporate the painting, I looked at the structures in the painting and tried to incorporate them in the way that the, the music itself flowed. Um, and that was kind of a starting point for me. Um, but I felt that it was really important that aspects of both uh, mediums of art and also the way that the biblical text was phrased kind of made its way in. Icon writing, and it's called writing rather than painting. Um, these paintings are iconic, so they're not part of the icon tradition. Icons themselves are windows, so we look at the icon, but the terrifying thing is that the saint or Jesus actually looks through the window back at us. Silvia Dimitrova was born in Bulgaria and she spent 10 years training as an icon writer or icon painter. Uh, and Downside Abbey, a Roman Catholic abbey and school, asked her to come over. They'd heard how good she was to paint an icon, or to write an icon, of St. Benedict. She did that, but she fell in love with Simon Potter, who was a teacher at the school, who was Anglican. So she's Bulgarian Orthodox, it's a Catholic school, and he's an Anglican. Um, I met her um, in Islington. Uh, and we, when I was Vicar of St Mary's Islington, she had an exhibition in our crypt. Um, and then uh, that's how we started doing the series of, of seven. I changed my mind uh, when I was applying for university. Um, I, at the time I was looking at medicine, I'd done all of the um, relevant A-levels. Um, I was looking forward to a career in medicine, I was thinking about um, various things I could be, you know, orthopaedic surgeons, trauma doctors, you know. And um, to do this in, in, in order to, um, to get work experience, I was working at Adam Brooks Hospital in a haematology ward. And um, one weekend whilst I'm there, uh, uh, a patient stops me and he says, you have to do music. He was a musician himself, he had a keyboard in his room. And he said, you have to do music. Um, your whistling in the corridor has done more for me over the past three weeks than the doctors have been able to do in three months. And the moment was changing and transformative for me. Before that, music had been a hobby, something that I enjoyed doing. Um, but afterwards I, I saw that it, it could sort of affect people positively in this way and I went home to my father and I, I said I'm going to do music and he kind of nodded <laughs> you know with it's uh, it, I'm, I'm sort of looking back on it he was wonderfully supportive because you know I had offers from some really top universities for medicine and turning them down was you know it was not a surefire thing um, and I think um, for me, the purpose of writing music has always been to engage with audiences, give them a sense of meaning in the work you're trying to portray. And it's, it's like a communication exercise, but it's not quite. It, I mean, if you have a communication exercise, you can say something that can be clear or it can be. Um, whereas music often describes, or frankly, constantly describes the ineffable. Um, and it's how we feel when we listen to a piece of music that informs us and, and brings us toward our own meaning with it. And but being such a personal thing, um, I believe that you know, well-constructed music can really be changing very positive for lots of people. And this is borne out in, in music therapy and you know, the wonderful work that music therapists do, but also in sort of more practical examples, um, which um, incidentally is why concerts are such an important thing because concerts themselves constitute a community of people who all come to experience something you know together some meaning some journey we're going on a journey to discover this together it began with my 50th birthday Alison said I'd like to buy you a present uh, I will pay Sylvia Dimitrova whom we knew to do a painting whatever painting you wanted and I chose Mary Magdalene on the Easter day when Jesus, she thinks, is the gardener. And Jesus says, Mary. 
And there's lots of paintings five seconds after that when she tries to touch him. And Jesus says, no, don't hold on to me. Um, but I hadn't seen any painting the second she hears her name. And I asked Sylvia to paint Mary's face and she did it beautifully. We thought the painting would be that big, <laughs> but she added Jesus and the trees and the angels and it, it's that big. Um, then um, the second one, it was only at that point that Sylvia and I and Ali, uh, we said, why don't we do a series? And seven is a biblical spiritual number. Uh, we then did um, Priscilla uh, that comes in Acts 18 after Acts 16 of Lydia. And having done three New Testament, we then thought we'd do the Old Testament, Sarah, um, and then Miriam, and then Ruth, and then Esther. So Esther was the last one that was painted and the last one that I wrote the poem on. For me, the purpose of writing music has always been to engage with audiences, give them a sense of meaning in the work you're trying to portray. We've had a hundred years of atonality and experimentalism, uh, which is continuing and I think is a wonderful thing. But it, to my mind, it's more like a tool. It's more like another colour on the palette. I think that actually the future for harmony is extremely bright as a, as a, as a topic within musical composition um, because the, the sphere is ever widening and as we come out of the, the, the need, as we kind of begin to throw off what we found in the last hundred years, we can begin to bring back and experiment with the other tools we had beforehand and actually that harmony is, is, a, is a topic that's to do with um, you know, one's own interpretation of how to use the tools or the things that we understand. And that is an enormously positive sentiment because it means that we can keep on finding tools forever. Mm -hmm. 